Hello, I'm Alina Polyakova, President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. Welcome to this conversation on the future of digital innovation, where we'll be talking about why a US-Europe digital partnership is key to competing with China. This event is part of SEPA's Digital Innovation Initiative, which seeks to ensure a democratic digital domain through greater collaboration between Europe and the United States. I'm going to pass the baton to my friend and colleague in Brussels, David Herzenkorn, who is the chief correspondent for Politico Europe in Brussels. David, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Well, thanks Alina so very much and welcome to everybody uh, for what should be a great uh, conversation. We're gonna jump right in. Uh, Carl Bildt, who's a former prime minister and foreign minister of Sweden and now all around uh, public intellectual in Europe and around the world sort of kicked this off uh, with an opinion piece in the Washington Post about China as a rising digital superpower uh, and how Europe and the US must catch up uh, together, he hopes. So we'll start there with uh, Carl, take it away. Uh, tell us uh, what was on your mind and what do you see happening out there? Well, I think what we see happening out of there is uh, what we all see. China has been doing uh, fantastic uh, development in terms of its economy, uh, trade and whatever. And what we see them as well is, of course, being very successful in the digital realm. They have uh, impressive entrepreneurs, that has to be said. They have a government and state commitment to research and development and to sort of furthering a digital agenda that is uh, extremely powerful and to a large extent so far has been successful. I mean, they have the right to do that. The world is a competitive place, but we also have to look at this and look at the new conditions that are there for the transatlantic relationship. If we go back some years and look at the transatlantic relationship, it is of course a security dimension that is still there, but it had a trade dimension. I remember we spent X numbers of years negotiating, negotiating something called the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, if I remember it rightly, uh, which was fairly difficult, both in the European political environment and in the US one. Then with Mr. Trump, it sort of disappeared from the horizon, no one mentioned it, and it's unlikely to be resurrected under Biden with a slightly more protectionist impulse that we see in the US political debate. But, uh, trade is important, but even more important is, of course, the digital relationship. We are leaving the industrial age. It's not industry 4.0, as some people say. In my opinion, we are entering the digital age. And what we see is that trade volumes are not increasing as fast as they used to be, as they used to do prior to 2008. But we see, of course, digital flows exploding. So we need to adjust the relationship to the digital age where we have a, a China that is successful uh, and impressive and competitive, and the fact that there are new conditions for the relationship across the Atlantic. Uh, that is what has led to me to say that, well, let's now create a digital partnership across the Atlantic so that we together can be more competitive in the uh, competitive race with that China that is going to be there for the next few decades. Is this easily done? Not necessarily, uh, because things are slightly different in the US and the European political environment, as we know. But um, one encouraging sign on the European side is that when the European Commission put on the table uh, its proposal for dialogue with the new American administration, the tech issues were fairly high up on that particular agenda. On the other hand, of course, you have a trend in the European debate talking about what they call digital sovereignty. It's somewhat unclear what that is. If it's directed against the Chinese or directed against the Americans, well, there might be different views on that. But if you look at the actual issues that needs to be sorted out across the Atlantic, they are fairly important. Uh, we have uh, an urgent need to make certain that we have free digital flows, free data flows across the in the Atlantic space that is now being threatened by some of the privacy regulations that are there in Europe. We had a privacy shield arrangement, which is now effectively being shot down by the EU Court of Justice and try to repair that. 
has to be a, a very urgent priority. I've talked to business in the last few weeks and they find the situation increasingly cumbersome uh, until this is uh, sorted out. We have slightly different approaches to platform regulation, which is a big issue in Europe uh, and is a, a thing that is moving in the American political space, we can notice with a new mood that is there at the moment. And there should be some sort of possibility to have a dialogue on that. We have other privacy issues, GDPR, uh, as of course a European standard that has been adopted by several places. California, I think, is even more stringent on, on these particular issues. And we have an ongoing debate about digital taxation, which is, uh, has all of the potential for getting somewhat acrimonious if we don't handle it in, in a dialogue. So what I see is the need to say that, well, the Atlantic relationship, that was security and that was trade and that was all of those things. But in the world in which we are now living, it has to be digital. If it's not digital, it's not gonna be that relevant. If we look a couple of decades ahead with China continuing to be successful in these areas. And to do that, you need to first to sort out the difficult issues that are there on the agenda where we have diverged somewhat, the ones that I mentioned uh, where there's a risk of us diverging, and then to have a more forward-looking approach. What can we do together perhaps in areas like AI, both regulation and innovation, quantum computing, semiconductors, and all of those issues that are gonna be fairly high up on the political agenda in the years ahead. So that's roughly my view. Uh, we live in a new era. Uh, we need to adjust the Atlantic relationship to that. Uh, we have a Chinese competition, which is impressive and uh, will be very important in the years ahead. And uh, this leads me to the conclusion that we must make a very serious effort to develop what I've called a digital Atlantic partnership for the future. Well, Carl, thank you so much. And now let's turn to Eileen Donahoe, who is uh, executive director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford uh, University, a former ambassador to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva under President Obama, and most important to me, a fellow graduate of Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, close to my heart. Uh, Eileen, maybe we can turn to you now for some perspectives on uh, the situation, particularly in the United States uh, going forward. So first, let me start by saying uh, I am completely aligned with the views Carl just expressed. And I think there's a lot of support for those views in the United States. Um, what, but what I wanna step back and talk about a little bit is how the United States is looking at the prospect of that kind of arrangement in Europe and how Europe is thinking about it from the vantage point of the United States. So there's, there's sort of three parts to our topic. One is this idea we, we need a partnership, a stronger partnership in the transatlantic context. It should be focused more on digital issues, digital technology investment and policy. And that the goal of that partnership is to counter rising China. I'm gonna be a little provocative here and say, um, there are many voices coming out of Europe and sometimes it's hard to discern which ones to pay attention to from if you're in the United States, but it is not at all clear that the majority view in Europe uh, agrees with those three points, that they, there is actually a desire for a stronger partnership with the US, that its focal point should be technology, including in joint investment, and a shared approach to regulation, if that's possible. And it's not even clear that um, there's a shared understanding that countering China should be the imperative. Um, what we do see is that on the technology front, um, Europeans are very focused on the downside risks of technology generally, mm -hmm. often very focused on US big platforms as the most malign actors, very focused on regulating, less interested in innovation and investment and understanding the importance of that side of the equation. Um, in terms of how Europeans seem to view the US and China, uh, we, we hear a lot of um, equivalence between the two. And in some cases, even seeing uh, 
the US as a less reliable partner and that there's less interest in partnering with the United States. And this idea that has been expressed about digital sovereignty is often heard as in relation primarily to the United States. Um, now, I here I have to acknowledge we just got past four years of Donald Trump as president of the United States. And we cannot, we couldn't overstate the significance of that presidency and how detrimental it has been. It's a tragedy on many dimensions, but in terms of the transatlantic alliance, it was very uh, destructive. And I, I have to acknowledge that as an American, um, but my hope is that the Europeans are able to you know, put that behind us because there are big threats on the horizon and recognize that we have a new president in Joe Biden that they can rely upon and who will be a much more traditional values-based American leader. Let me just say now, what do I think is really at stake if we don't do this? Um, I don't think the Europeans have recognized the big picture here. We are really in a geopolitical and normative battle over the governance model that will dominate in 21st century digital society. And this is really a competition between China's digital authoritarian model, which is spreading around the world, and a democratic human rights-based approach where the US and Europe should be aligned, but we are kind of in tension with each other over that. So while we've been fighting with each other and focused so much on American tech, what has China been doing? This model, um, A, they're, they're role modeling incredibly repressive uses of technology against their own citizens, also in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. They are exporting technologies of repression for censorship, surveillance. They're also exporting information communication systems, infrastructure that will um, create leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the countries where they're embedding it for decades to come. And they have massively upped their game in the international diplomatic realm, both with respect to technology standards. So they're influencing the uh, interoperabil interoperability protocols and standards of technologies of the future in their interests. They've had massive influence in more traditional normative arenas uh, like the Human Rights Council, where they've convinced uh, the majority of countries that Chinese use of technology in Hong Kong and Xinjiang it was legitimate. And where it, that's basically you know, an absurd position in a human rights council. Um, and they've been pressing this idea of cyber sovereignty, which is really antithetical to the original vision of a global open interoperable internet. And, which was the US vision and it was shared by Europe um, and the Freedom Online Coalition. So um, I, I absolutely, I recognize why there is this transatlantic rift, but we must heal that rift and technology policy needs to be at the heart of it. As Carl said, you know, replacement for privacy shield is, is step number one. But the real plea is look, pick your heads up, see the big picture and recognize you have a new partner in a new president in the United States and you've got a lot to work with. Well, Eileen, thank you so much. Definitely some provocative uh, thoughts there that we'll come back to in our wider discussion. Uh, talk about big picture, that's, that's what I cover um, at Political Europe, geopolitics. Uh, but my colleague, Laura Cayali covers technology issues every single day and is much better versed in them than I am. So she's graciously making a special appearance here. And I wonder, uh, Laura, thank you very much. Could you uh, share some brief thoughts on the level of consensus these days among the 27 European Union member countries and what the prospects might be for EU cooperation with the US vis-a-vis -vis China? Sure, well, first of all, I would like to react to one of the points that Eileen made that I think is very true, is that Europe doesn't really know yet what it thinks about China. Mm -hmm. uh, because if I take a very a specific example that we cover every day, which is Huawei, and whether Huawei should be accepted in 5G networks, you see that not all countries think the same. You have 
more bullish countries such as Sweden or Poland or to a lesser extent France with which have banned Huawei like it's a it's a it's a no-go but you have other countries for example Hungary who are less strict about what to do with Huawei which is kind of epitomized pretty early on which war we want China to have in Europe. Uh, for example, Germany, which as we all know is a leader in Europe, took a much longer to decide what to do with Huawei. And to be honest, it's not entirely clear still because Germany has a lot of economic interests in China as well. Uh, and on the investment agreement that Europe recently signed with China, the main pushback on, on labor rights came from the European Parliament, not from capitals. So the first step would for a transatlantic partnership indeed would be for Europe to decide what it wants. And the, the second thing that I, I would like to say is that besides Huawei, there's a big difference between the US and Europe uh, is that so far, Europe doesn't really look at Chinese companies with a national security angle, but more with an angle of compliance with EU privacy laws or EU consumer law. For example, TikTok, uh, under the Trump administration, the main angle against the, camp the company was national security, risks of snooping by the Chinese government. And in Europe too, TikTok is under scrutiny, but mostly when it comes to compliance with the general data protection regulation. So Italy recently moved against TikTok and required the app to make sure that underage kids couldn't sign up because of privacy things. But they also moved against Instagram, Clubhouse, and the angle is really compliance with GDPR, not necessarily national security risk. Um, and I think that's a big difference in philosophy and how Europe looks at Chinese companies, again, besides Huawei and ZTE and everything related to 5G networks, because this is a, a separate thing. And maybe the third and last thing I would like to say is that after the Trump administration, Europe is still not so sure what to think about the US either. And if I take France, which is my home country, which is the country I know, I know the most, they do have a, a strong stance against Huawei, but they also look with very suspicious eye at the US Cloud Act. And for example, there's, there's a big drama now because in France, health data are hosted by Microsoft. And this is creating a lot of problems. And this, this digital sovereignty that we mentioned earlier is, is really, is really a, a problem. And it doesn't mean they want it to be hosted by a Chinese company, for sure not, but by your European company. So I think that there is still a, still, they still need to figure out also whether they want to I mean, of course, the US will always be always be a more natural ally than China, but that doesn't mean that it's a 100% trust. Well, thanks, Laura. That was terrific. Uh, great perspective on the EU and certainly uh, more intensely focused on technology than I am every day. I wonder if, if picking up on the point about uh, France, Carl, if I could turn to you, because we've heard at the political level, uh, President Macron warn that in fact, uh, the US and the EU teaming up against China would be a mistake. And I wonder if putting, putting on your political hat there as a former prime minister and foreign minister, what's your reaction to that notion that in fact, it might be too provocative uh, for the US and uh, the EU to be overtly in uh, linking arms against China on the world stage uh, when it comes to digi uh, digital issues like this? Well, I, it, it certainly depends on which areas we are talking about. I mean, uh, it would be the most natural thing in the world to link up on, say, human rights issues, where sort of the, the values that we have on the European side of the Atlantic and what you have on the American side of the Atlantic are more or less identical. So there, of course, we link up. Uh, there might be other issues where there might be a divergence of interest. I don't know what President Macron was, uh, was alluding to. Uh, there is, if I might comment on some of the other things that were said, I mean, there's of course a slight divergence in the way in which we discuss China in uh, in the U.S. and 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 and, and Europe. Uh, I agree with nearly everything that Eileen said, although I would phrase it somewhat differently. I would not talk about countering China. Um, I would talk about being competitive with China. 
so that we have a positive agenda, what we do in order to be more competitive, more innovative, uh, creating the technologies of the future, uh, rather than sort of negative in trying to block the Chinese in different ways. And, and I say that also because I think a critical component of the entire strategy for the future is, I mean, now we are discussing the transatlantic relationship, but the transatlantic world is uh, fairly important, uh, but it's not the entire globe. Uh, we need to be able to reach out to take, take India or take Japan or take South Korea. And uh, if we go into sort of a more negative narrative only instead of the positive narrative, I think it might be slightly more difficult to build that global coalition that we must do with the starting point being the, uh, being the, uh, the, the Atlantic world. Um, there are a number of things we can do. Let me just comment on the Huawei situation and 5G because 5G is of course, an area where Europe has sort of technology leadership uh, we are competing with Huawei and coming from Sweden and Ericsson, I mean, we've been dealing with Huawei for quite some time. Also the security aspects of it because we've been aware of these things for, I think longer than even the United States has in, in, in this particular area because we have had the technology leadership. And, and it's a complicated relationship uh, because um, there has been a cooperation for a fairly long time in developing the local standards or the global standards um, together with the leading, I mean, the leading technology companies on the world are sitting together and developing the technology standards. The Chinese are so far, are so far part of that, which I think is a, not a negative thing that we can have sort of a global standard that is in conformity with our interest. They have been, as Aileen is aware of in the ITU and other places, putting up proposals for other standards uh, that uh, we cannot accept. Uh, but so far it's been possible to build global coalitions to make certain that that doesn't happen. I agree that we should be more alert than we have been so far on uh, the exports of different technology for surveillance and repression and all of that. Although I would just add that uh, I've seen another country that is closer to us, that is Israel, being perhaps even more aggressive, certain firms there, in exporting those types of technologies to fairly repressive regimes, or the fairly repressive regimes that were, at least during the Trump administration, fairly close to, to, uh, to Washington. The difference in the European and American approach to China uh, that is perhaps more fundamental is that while it's possible, uh, unrealistic, but perhaps possible in the US to start to discuss decoupling and see China as a threat to dominant position, that perspective isn't there in Europe. Uh, Europeans see China as a fact. Uh, it's going to be the world's largest economy. It's going to be the world's largest market. It's going to be the driving force of the global economy. And if we look at the figures, there's no way around that. And the best way of handling it is to make certain that we are competitive in our, I mean, taking care of the security issues, needless to say, uh, that's, that's the foundation. But above that, being certain that we are competitive in our economies, and in order to be competitive in our economies and be that on a global scale, it is of course far better if we can do that together, because that would make us far, far more powerful in setting the global standards and the global norms that will be something that in that particular case, even China long term will have to, uh, will have to uh, at least adjust to the one way or the other. And we do, Carl, hear that in Brussels all the time, the, the EU sort of saying that, you know, it does accept China as this fact, the rise of China, and both at one and the same time recognizes needing to work with China, negotiate with China, as well as recognize China as a systemic rival, is the phrase they're using now in terms of human rights uh, politically. Eileen, I'm sure there are a number of, of Carl's points that you're eager to respond to, but I wonder if I might throw also into the mix the idea that we hear sometimes in, in Europe, not just in Europe, that some of the tendencies toward uh, what we might call technological authoritarianism that you uh, ascribe to Beijing might also be seen in the behavior of some of the big behemoths like Amazon. 
that in fact, uh, in their corporate behavior, they're not beholden to voters, uh, moderately so perhaps to shareholders, but that in fact, they're able to dictate policy in the places they go because they are so big. And how, do you, how does that fit into your view and possibly the idea that from a European perspective where they don't have the global leaders, uh, I know Alina's looking to jump in as well too, you know, where, where does that uh, come into play? Uh, well, maybe Alina, we turn to you. Uh, we turn to you first, and then we come back to Eileen. Sure. Uh, thanks, David. I just wanted to to follow up on some of the points, which I also find myself agreeing wholeheartedly with Carl and Eileen. Uh, Eileen, I know that I would agree because we wrote a paper together making a very similar argument to what Carl has laid out, called the transatlantic effort to take on China starts with technology, and that is very much, I think, what Carl has been. Uh, elaborating in this very eloquent way on, on, in, in terms of this discussion, but a couple of points. I think one, the key question here to my mind is what is Europe's place in the digital world? And I think to the same extent that Europe doesn't know, I think as Laura rightfully said, it's views on China, I don't think there's a broad European view on what Europe can add value on and how it can really make an impact in the race for digital and emerging technologies. And I think the answer to that from the commission certainly and from Brussels has been, we want to be the leader in the regulation in setting the norms and the standards. And of course, everything that the EU does on digital regulation like GDPR isn't just going to affect Europe and European member states, it has global ramifications. But I think the reality is that you cannot lead on regulation if you cannot lead on innovation. And that is, of course, the point that both Carl and Eileen have also made. And I think that, to my mind, is key. Because if you aren't the leader in technology, how can you really regulate technology and companies and the, and the broader sector? I think the, the second point I'd make is that we have spent now decades since the digital revolution took off uh, a long time ago at this point. Um, focusing on market share and really thinking about technology as in terms of markets, in terms of competition, in terms of innovation. But we have not really thought about governance in a real way. And of course, China has. From the very beginning of internet penetration, Beijing has thought about digital governance and how that fits into its own agenda to control increasingly its own population and to exert increasing influence abroad. And now we're playing catch up. And we're playing catch up, not just as Europe or the United States, we're playing catch up as a community of democracies. And we need to start, there's an urgency to this, even though it may not feel urgent because we can just go on like this probably for longer, but we were going to find ourselves waking up in a very different kind of world where we're already in a splinter net, you know, where you have a Chinese internet that looks very different from a European internet we increasingly have uh, Russian internet looks very different from all of those. And of course that kind of so-called sovereign internet model or the cyber sovereignty concept is very appealing to other countries across the world. And particularly countries where you have leaning, leanings towards authoritarianism. And I think we're going to wake up in a world where we no longer can ensure that the digital domain remains rooted in democratic values and principles. So we need to think not just in terms of markets, but also in terms of norms, as Eileen very rightfully said. Um, just the last thing, and then I wanna you know, hear from Eileen to what Carl has put on the table as well, um, is that you know, the big issue I see is a dividing line between greater cooperation, Europe and the US, which I think all of us agree needs to happen as soon as possible. And of course the European Commission's uh, stated agenda that they released at the end of last year, the end of 2020, uh, include to, included a very strong component on tech policy to work together with the US. This is a proposal by the commission. And I think the US got, administration should take that up and take it seriously and really, really get into the details of what it really means. But I think the big issue is that everything that is currently happening in Brussels really treats foreign companies the same. And I understand, of course, why that is. But what that means in practice is that US companies and other Western companies that are independent of governments are treated in the same way 
as Chinese companies, which are of course not independent and are state controlled, but they're all treated as foreign companies. And I think we need to first take a step back and realize there has to be a set of standards for distinguishing between foreign investment from a certain kind of company that may have uh, other uh, political agenda behind it versus a company that has a profit agenda behind it. And that is uh, ha that has to conform to democratic norms and principles. Where as you know, Huawei and ZTE, I think as Laura rightfully uh, alluded to, um, they function under a very different operating model. And when we talk about data privacy, obviously, I would trust personally, I think most Europeans still would trust Microsoft with their data, I hope, versus you know, Huawei or any of the others. But I think we need to understand what are the differences between foreign, foreign, so-called foreign investment. And I think Europe needs to have a much stronger mandate that has an enforcement mechanism for reviewing foreign investment that is coordinated across the member states that currently is very weak and doesn't have enough teeth and I think this is, there's a lot of things we could talk about as actionable starting points. Uh, but I think those are the things I would put on the table uh, to think about. And to my mind, you know, the move towards digital sovereignty, which all of us have been discussing, um, is only going to make cooperation that much more difficult because it's going to obscure the bigger picture that we need to work together rather than putting up these so-called digital world gardens um, and trying to protect ourselves, but we're protecting ourselves from um, through that impulse, we're protecting ourselves from um, is only going to open opportunities for exploitation by state authoritarian countries uh, like China. And Alina, maybe you know, it's actually a very fascinating paper that, that the two of you have put together, a transatlantic effort to uh, mm -hmm. take on China starts with, with technology. Maybe I could ask you one question on a point you made before we jump back into the debate. And that is the idea, because I know uh, here in Europe, there will be some strong reaction to this idea that because they're not leading in innovation in the private sector, that therefore they don't have the standing to be the, the regulators. And I think one thing you might hear in response is that in fact, it's precisely because uh, these big corporate players are American, that maybe that compromises the American regulators in a way that makes them too soft, too favorable toward uh, these industry players who are you know, home team, so to speak. And does it really require uh, being the, the home base, the geographic home base of, of these innovators when in fact, Washington, you would argue, you know, you know, didn't, uh, didn't do Google, you know, create Google, you know, maybe Stanford did, uh, Eileen can jump in, but d is that actually a requirement or is it possible that the EU might be a more neutral regulator in a way because it doesn't have the, the sort of hometown stake in, uh, in those big Silicon Valley companies? You know, in, for first, yes. I think in my view though, um, the US government should be first and foremost responsible for setting a regulatory agenda for US companies. And we have been absent from that table. But of course these are not, they may be based in the US, but of course these are global entities that have you know, incredible influence um, over the digital economy, not just in Europe, but across the world. And that's exactly why rather than, I think, uh, rushing towards all of these regulatory packages that the EU has rushed towards, uh, the Digital Services Act, Digital Market Act, Europe should work together with Washington to come up with a coherent and hopefully collaborative and coordinated regulatory agenda, because we're all concerned about the same things. And I think if you follow the policy debate in the US Congress, there is a huge amount of vitriol <laughs> and anger against big tech in the US. Um, if anything, perhaps that is one place uh, where <laughs> Washington and Brussels have, a, have common ground. The problem of course, is that because we have such a polarized political environment in the United States, nothing has passed the US Congress. But if you track the legislative proposals, it's a huge amount of proposals that if anything passes on section 230 reform, uh, which affects content moderation basically, or antitrust, which we might see movement on, or data privacy. As you mentioned, this has been happening at the state level, primarily California and others, but this could become a federal and a national issue quite soon as well. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of conversation and there's a huge amount of desire to do something, but we just 
in the Washington have not been able, because of our own political divisions and polarization, uh, really get anything uh, through Congress. And certainly I think this administration will take a very different approach to technology than, than, than the previous one. Eileen, reactions? Oh, too much to so talk much. about. Um, so let me go back to one plus couple points Carl made. Um, I completely agree. This has to be a, a an attractive approach globally. Where it's not just about the transatlantic alliance; it is also attracting India and really rallying the world to a values-based vision of technology use, as well as uh, values-based regulation of technology. Um, so, but I do think. Unfortunately, if we don't get the transatlantic alliance you know, together, we're not gonna have a lot of success going global. So they go hand in hand. I, a quick point on the, I agree, we have to be careful on the language of um, you know, too, too hawkish and it's really about competition. Mm -hmm. um, I, on the decoupling point, I would say um, in the United States, you know, even though Trump was pushing in a decoupling kind of vein, U.S. industry is not interested in decoupling. We are very dependent on, like Apple is dependent on the Chinese market, and manufacturing. So that is not what people are seeking, but there is a desire um, to protect certain critical industries, semiconductors, um, and there is concern about, obviously, information infrastructure that does have national security implications. Um, but let's go, I'm gonna to touch on this larger question about uh, regulatory power uh, versus technology power. And maybe that Europe is in a better place because it isn't leading in the technology. I, I will say that there is another, besides the ability to create regulations in Europe, part of what I think I see the Europeans missing is that China's technology dominance is giving it the power to influence global norms. And there is that link. It's, it's this idea that in 21st century digital context, dominance in technology, all kinds of power, military power, economic power, geopolitical power, and even normative power derive in substantial part from their dominance in tech. The reason they are able to influence the conversation in the Human Rights Council isn't because they're right on the norms. It is they have growing leverage around the world and they are using it very effectively. And I think the Europeans need to recognize that I also want to say that the, a lot of the trust, besides Donald Trump, a lot of the trust that is broken down between Europe and the United States is on um, fundamental rights. You know, if you, we, it almost goes back to Snowden and you know, government snooping and, and, and sharing of data between US tech. And I feel like some of the movement in Europe and on the regulatory front itself doesn't really uh, support democratic values and fundamental rights. And some of the regulatory approaches, especially on platform liability for user-generated content, actually is undermining that original vision of an open internet. And um, in fact, Germany's Nets DG was immediately copycatted by Russia and it was copied in Venezuela. Um, and the instinct to go toward digital sovereignty is so much akin to the authoritarian view of let's, let's go back to this idea that we, we do not have global connectivity, access to information, free flow of data and information, free expression. Let's put up our boundaries. And oh, by the way, what comes with that is you're not allowed to criticize us from the outside in. That's a, that's a long-standing authoritarian position is, you know, external criticism on the basis of human rights or fundamental rights, you don't get to do that. And so I, I do think people have to be really careful there. The, the intention is good, but the implications for the global internet and the future of a democratic vision of interconnectivity is being um, undermined by some of the moves in Europe at, at a, on the regulatory level.
Well, thanks, Eileen. So many important points. Uh, such a fascinating conversation. We could go on forever, but we're running out of time. Maybe, Carl, if you want to come back with some closing thoughts. Uh, you know, we've seen, for instance, talking about Congress, Mark Zuckerberg point out that uh, antitrust action would weaken U.S. companies. But also, interestingly, we've seen China moving uh, on uh, with antitrust rules against some of its own big tech companies, Alibaba included. Uh, close us out here. What are your takeaways? Well, I mean, closing out by being somewhat optimistic. On the governance model, I mean, we, we, we should not forget the fact that the governance is essentially Western. I mean, I can internet and whatever. We've been able to safeguard what we call the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance against uh, sustained attacks for quite a number of years. It's still roughly intact, the model that we have. We've been able to beat back the efforts in the, the ITU that the Chinese have been undertaking in order to twist uh, the fundamentals of the uh, internet protocols. So far, so good. And, and, and we are setting the standards for the 5G. I mean, Huawei is operating according to the standards that are sort of more European than Chinese and American. So far, so far. Um, so what we are looking at is really the future. And here I think that we have to look at primarily being innovative, competitive, uh, because if, if you are not innovative and competitive, the rest of the world will turn Chinese the one way or the other, because they say they do better things. Then we must have more regulatory alignment of sorts. I, I, I agree with a lot of comments that have been made uh, by both Alina and Eileen on, on, on the regulatory philosophy of part of the European debate. Uh, but it should be possible to initiate a dialogue. Now, I, I see, I saw in the media the other day, Senator Kubitschar had launched a massive package of proposals for platform regulation in the US. And the proposals that are on the table from the commission a couple of months ago, um, EU is not something that is done for speedy decision-making. Uh, this is something that will go through the parliament and the council of ministers for one or two years until we see that materializing. So there should be ample space, I think, for closer dialogue between so the commission and the US administration, between the European parliament and the US Congress, and think thanks, uh, more interest on the European side wouldn't hurt, and business leaders, in order to make certain that we are more aligned so that we can keep the advantage that we so far have and make certain that we are so competitive that we are able to show the rest of the world that we are better than the Chinese and that we are, as Eileen rightly said, we are value-based in a way that uh, they will never be. Thanks so much, uh, Carl Bilt, Eileen Donahoe, Alina Polyakova. Terrific conversation. We're glad that you're able to join us today.